So, uh, Thomas Andreas from Futo 2, Dystopia in the Box. Yeah. So, I, I didn't choose the title. It's a very catchy title, I have to say. We all like dystopia, I guess, or at least are somewhat interested. Happy to explain what a dystopia is. But before I do, let me just quickly introduce ourselves. We are a so called critical design studio. That does not necessarily mean we do critical design, which is more art. I think we are service providers such as I guess most of you guys are. We try to, you know, we try to differentiate us on the market, you know, by being a little bit more in the foresight game, also looking more into organizations, which is by definition not necessarily a big differentiator anymore. But you know, but we are very much interested though in consequence of web products. And we have been doing that since 2020, which was a very unfortunate time, of course, to found any company after six or seven weeks or so after we founded the company, Corona hit. And a few days before we joked about the coronavirus, you know, and this is when we then end up in our very own dystopia. We are interested traditionally coming from the human machine interaction, of course, about the human machine relationships, the human human relationships are, you know, because mostly, I guess, service design and the latest, like the latest, the ongoing, you know, about ethics and inclusion in design, as well as the role of the employee, the relationship between the organization and the human, so to speak. We've been working a lot in the past for me, mostly like consultancy side, Thomas also, you know, on the product side a lot. And we've always been working in form of project or product on product design mostly. There is a certain, we worked on hardware products or the interface side of hardware products, such as cars and show cars for various manufacturers, household appliances and such. Of course, a lot of things that happened on the mobile phone, although we did that already before the iPhone came out, which gives us like a little bit of a also special you know, idea about the medium. We do nowadays a lot of research and more product strategy jobs, but also work very hands on, you know, on screen design. Although the focus shifted over the last couple of years. So design is the rendering of intent. Jared Spool said, my interpretation of what he's saying is if I work together, you know, coming from the outside inside organizations is often like, okay, my intentions as a designer are very good, you know, but guys, I can only help you so much, you know, so we are paid to, to help them with delivering experiences, but whether it's like the organization or, you know, as a, as a third party or a consultancy, we try to wisely choose our partners and the projects, but you also have to, you know, question what is actually going on. I don't blame any person nowadays, you know, for fleeing the reality because the real reality at the moment is pretty grim. One could say that, that, you know, post COVID, you know, the dystopia didn't really stop. You know, we have war, at least it's like the war this time is a little bit closer, you know, Ukraine, there is still things happening, you know, which we cannot control such as uh, Syria and Turkey. But also there's a lot of uh, bullshit on every level happening, you know, politics of, you know, the, the important things that, you know, shape our society, I'd say. So if people want to escape, you know, to other realities, we don't really blame them. That's just like an observation of the last, you know, last 10 years or so. Ray Kurzweil says, you know, that the world is actually not getting worse. You know, the information is just getting better. and We are probably not used to really digest all of that. So... I think it's fair to assume that, you know, we all are pretty similar, you know, um, which means that we don't want to be shot at, you know, we just want to have, you know, a shelter, we want to have our folks, and we want to, you know, excel and thrive and, you know, enjoy life mostly. And this is still something that is very fundamental. And this is, <laughs> I think, something that the world is still struggling with. Back then, you know, when there was still a religion a little bit more prominent, I guess, it's fair to say that there was like more of a unified code, you know, different religions had their, their different codes. And of course, they also fought themselves, you know, but at least there was like a shared set of values, which is great. So we are all trying to believe in something, I think it's, it's fair to say. So 
you know, <laughs> role models nowadays are looked for, you know, in the weirdest places and worries me, to be honest. I don't want to give Kim Kardashian too much shit, you know, but really. And if Kardashians are too mainstream, you know, then you can also go for like even, you know, weirder beliefs. I'm having a hard time to judge people that, you know, are looking for answers, you know, in the weirdest places because the world got more complex. And yeah. And so, you know, if you want to join QAnon, join QAnon. You know, I just don't think that this is where the answers align. So if people have trouble, you know, to see through a complex world that they would love to have like simple answers for, you can either, you know, go on the journey to see other places, you know, break your routines, fly to the Mars, you know, to so basically just like a journey outwards. A lot of people choose the journey inwards, which is, you know, either read a book, watch a movie, you know, any sorts of drug that you can think of, or like metaverse, you know, for example, or like the virtual side of the world, you know, which consists of pixels maybe, but in a lot of these aspects here, you know, when it comes to, you know, travel entertainment, you know, the virtual world, like designers have their hands in. So for us, you know, we don't have to look so far, you know, to see, you know, that there is a certain fascination with a mobile phone, for example, in which we can sync for hours and hours. And most people actually can. If you watch just now, like a bus is passing by here, the window. And as far as I can see, it's double back of bars, you know, most people are staring on their mobile phones, you know. So that thing, technical innovation, had a huge impact. At the same time, what's fascinating, you know, is even if the person that you tried to talk to that's standing right in front of you basically disappeared because their mind is somewhere else, I can assume that maybe their character popped up somewhere, either to write an email to someone or maybe, you know, is somewhat present in another in another dimension, if you will. So that is like, okay, is that a chance? You know, is that horrible? I have an opinion on that. And so has probably everybody <laughs> here in that session. What we were wondering a while back was, you know, a lot of companies, tech companies, you know, started with good intentions, you know, and somehow ended up, you know, with unintended consequences. But this is not necessarily, a, you know, dystopia per se, but it's a lot of indicators that this is something that we felt that it should be worth looking into that. The reason that that happens, I guess, is because we are working along the happy path as designers pretty close to the product, you know, not sometimes a little bit more if we have capacity caring about the organization or, you know, sometimes maybe discussing society, the potential only, you know, never the, the negative side of things, never the negative side of the product or what it can do to, you know, society or the environment. So what we did, and you have to know that Berlin, of course, it's somewhat political, you know, there's the anti, the anti Amazon cafe, no, so it's, I guess, a little bit similar to San Francisco. There is a certain undercurrent of protest here against things becoming too commercial, which is fine. So we used that back then to try out a couple of methods, you know, to maybe predict negative consequences, just to evaluate whether we can somehow embed that in the design, product design process at some point. What we had is we had a couple of cards that we call the disaster cards and we put that onto a method that is called that usually is called the steeple method we just inverted that you know in a negative way and then just you know came up with concepts that you know where we could end up and one of those things was for example the drones of you know if if amazon would populate their fleet you know with drones what would this mean and also created like a you know a disaster sheet with a concrete, you know, negative unintended consequences that could happen. Spoiler alert, it's not so easy because there's a lot that you can come up with, but it is worth to take a look at it, which brings us to the box. As you know, our distinguished colleagues, you know, from Accenture, McKinsey, every bigger company that is active in that space releases like a trend report end of the year, beginning of the year and such. And for us, you know, we toyed with the idea to also do ourselves 
like something we call the emotional trend report to basically write our own way, but we didn't find the time. So the closest we got is basically the dystopian, the dystopian trend card box, which has a couple of things that you might consider, you know, we're not even sure if this is a trend or whether this is rather reality. It comes with some nice descriptions on the backside and we intend to use them in our workshops. They're just basically are fresh, freshly printed, you know, just three weeks ago. And there's a lot of funny anecdotes all around, you know, from, from, you know, widely accepted racism to bureaucracy. And of course, like the design lobbyist, I mean, you know, the role, it really exists already in real time. So it's not really, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And it was seen more as an creative outlet for us. And of course, the establishment of like a new little tool for us to facilitate workshops. There are a couple of them. So it was a little bit of work, probably less work than creating a whole trend report. So how we ended up with the dystopian trend cards though, is because of course we created custom trend cards for facilitating workshops in regards of the futures thinking for our clients. The way that works, as I said in the beginning, we create a bunch of, you know, we research, of course, everything that we don't have yet. In that case, it was for autonomous driving for a client who wants to roll out in two years, like a fleet of autonomous cars. And in order to look into the future with them together, we created a handful of trend cards that then get used to build scenarios. You basically place them on the so-called steeple analysis, which is pictured here where you can like from different levels, from individual to, to, to social or ecological level through different lenses, like, like legal or economical or technological, you can work in groups to create settings in which you then place your product. That again, hence more about the opportunities for the future, not so much the dangers. In order to, because, yeah, so obviously we sit a lot in front of virtual meetings. We found that cards are just a very good tool, tactile products. We don't only use cards, but actually the people like them a lot. So in this case here, this is provocation cards. You know, if you need like an additional challenge to make things a little bit more interesting or spicy and to assure that there's like a mostly quirky and rich outcome. This here is, for example, a workshop for PT scientists. Now it's called the Planetary Transportation Service, which is, believe it or not, here in Berlin. And their job is basically rocket scientists who plan to take so-called payload on a platform to the moon, which is basically the B2B arm from the, the manned space program. And it was more like a, let's say a futuristic service design challenge where you need to train rocket scientists to be more service design thinking, you know, in order to not only be able to fly things into space, but also in order to shape offers, you know, for people to easily understand the offer. As you can see here in the template, you know, value creation was an important, you know, what kind of values are being created, something that designers often have also problems with, you know, in regards to their, their own work. So that was interesting. You know, as I said, we try to mostly choose our clients and our projects very wisely. This is like a project that is for a right hailing company that was very close to our heart. We designed, uh, we helped them to design or capture like the requirements for handicapped people, visually impaired, walking impaired, wheelchair users, you name it, you know, as like on the software side for one, but also on the other hand, on the hardware side, as in the vehicle that has the, the ramp. Does it need an extra bottle? Do we need a light here? How does that logistically work? And so on and so on. So that was pretty nice. And with those guys, we also did future thinking workshop on that subject. When it comes to the virtual world, you know, it's, it's not that we only people in the virtual world are also real people, right? So we have a certain interest in that to help them equally for 
like our friends from the bridge cure they are basically they have like a psychology therapeutic background and they try with virtual reality to simulate all the situations that an alcohol addicted you know comes in naturally because it is much more it is much more immersive than the usual therapy which is just consists of talking to each other right yeah so we are just about to work with them on the whole interaction language and also something that we consider you know making the world maybe a little bit of a better place even though we know we are not going to completely save it you know but we try to do our part yeah i mean of course in the virtual world this is also the metaverse is a big topic might be that the outcome like from our side is basically left open we are not we don't consider us being in the midst of it but we are very much interested in seeing where it can help currently it appears a little bit that this is going to be something that the people simply feel they do not need you know we are trying to be open to the you know to the possibilities and like the idea of the colleagues from argo design for example you know that each for example that each location you know can be layered with different experiences such as like a starbucks layer you know the facebook layer etc cetera, etc cetera. yet again whether it brings people together whether it does any good for the world is like something that still yet needs to be proven as long as the different metaverses are owned by big you know singular companies so as they say you know the future is not what it used to be i think it's really in the end uh, yet again yet again i know it's an old one but it is about the responsibility of the designer you know to not forget that we are also doing something or contributing something in different directions and we have a choice to do so to make people's lives more miserable or more or better and with that i conclude thank you thanks so much i really love hearing about your experience and these cards that you guys just put out and so we have some really great questions in in the chat so i think we'll just kind of get into those if we can if you want to maybe stop sharing your screen we can see each other bring it perfect <laughs> and and thomas if you want to jump in at any point feel free but also feel free to not unmute well we won't put you on on spotlight as well but thanks for sharing this so one of our first questions and it was in the beginning and maybe to give some reference for people as this is a reference from slide two is what is a shared future versus what else <laughs> so like well, how would you maybe describe what like for other people who are not as familiar with this uh, kind of thinking process or or how would you describe shared futures? So the shared future refers mostly, it, it is not It is not an approach, it is nothing what it is, it's just saying we are all in this together. And this is, you know, we can't forget that that Fridays for Future thing, you know, happened now for quite a long time. This is, illustrates to me like the best, how shared is not necessarily shared. The point is that we all breathe the same air, but, you know, it seems that whatever, let's say Generation Z, they have like the shared idea that the environment is important, you know, look at the older generations, look at, you know, let's say geographically in different spots, you know, this is not shared, you know, this is like, ultimately it's all one, you know, but even to get that point across is something that was politicized, you know, over the last decades, you know, and we are making just so micro steps, you know, that don't make a major impact. So I think shared future is merely like a wish, you know, from our side, you know, then this is any sort of reality at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'm kind of curious of if you've seen in your workshops and working with different segmented groups, like this kind of turnout in different ways, and maybe you can reference that also with this, up, this next question, which is like, when doing research, how do you approach discussing the future and how do you help envision the future for like other people, let's say? So when it comes to workshops, you know, of course, you know, we are the Germans and so on, you know, so, but we are not cynics, right? So we can, the people are used to that. We, you know, having like some, some more dark humor or, you know, bringing like a little bit of dystopia, but ultimately, of course, most people just want, you know, like, nice outcomes, you know, constructive outcomes, you know, towards like a better world. So, yeah, what do we do? I mean, 
ultimately, let's say the the whole futures thinking, you know, in the design business at the moment, I think is. I'm not sure whether it's really like the postcessor of design thinking, you know, but there is a need for people to align with each other. It is often, you know, we are not necessarily ending up by saving the world in the workshops. You know, it is mostly that the people themselves start talking about things that they hardly ever talk about. And also the designers don't talk about much about future, you know, except if they make their money with it, you know. So I think this is not bad for for nobody to to do that. But the outcome is very often, you know, that you get groups to agree on things. They are seeing each other, you know, as people, getting to know each other better by, you know, by putting up those those big pictures, you know, by addressing the big issues that, for example, their business lives in. You know, mm-hmm. this is why this is important for us. And with the cards that you've you 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 kind of presented today, have you started using some of those in some of these workshops? And and can you tell us about how maybe that has reference or kind of influenced what you were just talking about about getting people to talk about it as well? Sure. I mean. First of all, I said the dystopian cards, they are pretty much new. You know, we haven't used them yet when it comes to normal trend cards. You know, I think that for us, everything that gets people talking is is a valid tool. And so if you start to, you know, build your tools, of course, yourself, you know, and to be fair, the, the if you research trends and you put trends together, you know, in a print format, et cetera, et cetera, that's a little bit of work. But we feel that the people really appreciate it because it is tailored to them. You know, that I think also makes us a little bit special. And I think the people see that we put love in our work for them. Pretty often it is that there's, I mean, you know how organizations work. You know, you always have like the ones that think that far ahead, you know, of everything. There's like a whole bunch of rather normal people that, that have a life, you know, and so that ping pong between those people or the collision between those those groups that discuss things that, you know, mostly terms that they have either heard or never heard before, that is that is what makes good discussions, you know, because ultimately you bring it back to their business, to the ecosystem, sometimes, sometimes directly to the product, not right at the beginning, you know, it's really about the big picture, about the future in which we want to live in. And this makes it very powerful and you need some facilitation in order to build to build scenarios because if you it it gets very abstract very fast if you don't have like very particular tools for that yeah yeah and i think one of the things i've seen too like at first they're like oh there's nothing positive or like this is just an exercise i'm not going to get anything out of it but really kind of breaking those boundaries and letting people have a little bit of fun and think in different ways, I think, and I've seen so many times in groups and workshops that it really can be powerful in what comes out of those scenarios as well. The people, the people want to show themselves, you know, even the most introverted ones, you know, you need to give them a chance, you know, to, to shine, to, you know, express their personality and their opinion through something, Mm -hmm. you know, once you've managed that, you know, it's going to be an interesting and exciting workshop. Humor is a super important component. You know, we don't always, we take our clients and their, their mission seriously. We don't take ourselves too serious. We skip the dystopia definition part. You know, I think ideally you have the utopia, you know, on the one side, you know, which is too good to be true. And the dystopia is just too shitty to, to bear. You know, on the other hand, in between, you might have like the protopia, which is basically a future while we go along, you know, just my understanding at least of it. So, yeah, so when we come to the dystopia, itself maybe it's fair to say that that you can of course always look at the customer's needs and wants and so on you know but i think it's also interesting nowadays in a very complex times in which we live in what their fears are you know because if you help them losing some of those you know you might also have might have an you know competitive advantage i Mm -hmm. believe yeah and I, th- I was hearing you talk a little bit about like what role you might have as a facilitator in this discussion or like allowing people to feel safe to kind of talk about this. And one of our questions here is how important is it to be politically neutral with in when talking about critical design and talking about these kind of situations and wondering what your thoughts are on that? Well, Thomas and me, we had the pleasure to work very international. So he was a lot in the US and in India. 
and we also work in, in, in Asia. I used to work in, in the States as well, and of course, all over Europe. So when you are in, in Overland Park somewhere in Kansas, you know, then homosexuality, religion, or politics is off the table. When your audience is more interested, you know, more liberal, you know, I think you can throw in, <laughs> in everything, you know. But I think you need to reach your audience, you know. At some points, you're just going to piss them off, you know. That's not the that's not the job you want to have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm hearing it's just like really knowing your audience well, <laughs> like, and getting to know them beforehand and understanding where their, like, kind of experience and boundaries are, and that can really kind of help you play in how much you can kind of experience and play in that space. I think that that workshops over the last, whatever, 10 years in design business became not only more important because facilitation, not as just as a moderator, but also when it comes to, you know, sharing knowledge, you know, on certain things became more important. But I also feel that companies and people are more open now for important topics, you know, it's so the role as a, of a designer 15, 20 years ago was more to get your briefing, you know, and then you would do your best, of course, to collaborate with the client. But now they, we are booked, you know, to make the people talk and to make people think, you know, and to get something out of the people that you usually can, other than, you know, produce whatever 10 key screens for an iPad app or something like that, you know. So the, the I think that's, the times have changed and there is there is movement in the market, you know, as far as I can tell from an organization side. Yeah. yeah. I there was a question in here too about like if you kind of wanting to start get involved with future thinking or critical design. Do you have any spaces or places to suggest to people of like where to get started? This one asks specifically about Berlin, but maybe you have some other ideas too of like how to get involved in this kind of space more. Because I know there's a lot of people who want to, they're just not sure how to start because they're maybe in a more traditional, you know, mid-level product design yeah. position and, and they kind of want to start exploring in in this areas a little bit more. So reading is a good one. Um, came just out, you know, Design Fiction. It's a rock solid book from our colleagues, Julian Bleeker, Nick Foster, and colleagues. But there's other good ones. Actually, on our Instagram site, we have, which is Futur 2 Studio, is the is our ID on, on Instagram. I'm sure, and we have a bunch of books that we can recommend. When it comes to Berlin, like a really, really beautiful place that also offers courses that you can participate. And I think maybe probably even for free is the Futurium. The Futurium is like a wonderful space close to the, to, to the station. It's really a huge museum kind of thing, but more experiential. And they only care about the future. They're currently working on, they're currently working on the topic politics, future of politics and like e-participation and such. And we helped our colleague from, from Studio Brühl in one of the interactive works that are going to happen there. This is super interesting. They currently, I think they ran like the future of mobility now for quite a while. And get in there, you can spend basically the whole day in there and uh, check out what kind of events they are hosting there. Yeah, that's great. I actually have not been there yet. And so I feel like I'll have to check that out now as well. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, you should, you should. The people are also popping up at Futures Thinking workshops and events, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not so difficult to get to know them. They're very nice. Cool. We have a question here. Do we need the metaverse or what is your thoughts on how this might kind of play in? The metaverse. The metaverse? The metaverse. <laughs> it's been, it's been, the problem is that before the metaverse, you know, we were working pretty much almost 20 years, you know, on the mobile phone, in, in the mobile phone industry. And there were a lot of things that were like supposed to, now that's the biggest thing, it's going to come for sure, you know, and then it never came. So I'm being, first of all, very skeptical, you know, when it comes to technologies in general. This is not, I wouldn't, of course, uh, refer to the metaverse as technology. I'm just saying that it's, they try a little bit too hard, you know, to, you know, and, and of course, as a designer, you put a lot of love into things, but it reminds me a little bit when we connected the car with a mobile phone at some point, you know, that was like 2007 or so. Then later we did like a very boring as, how do you call that? Like the, like a training bike at home, you know, 
we attached data to it, you know, wow, technically you can, we did that with like a previous company employer did it with, with a toothbrush, you know, now we have a new, that thing makes you believe, wow, basically everything that's kind of like whatever, there's a pencil, there's a mechanical pencil. If I get data access to that, I can make something very special out of that, you know, because it, as designers, we wanted to, you know, see how that, how that evolves. And we want to believe that everything we touch is going to be great. But if you look at the IoT market, you know, it's not the case, you know, and with the metaverse, the problem is a little bit that it's a little bit too capitalistic at the moment, you know, like everybody who's smart, it's like similar to the real estate business, you know, let's do the same shit in the virtual realm, you know, let's occupy the virtual realm as soon as we can and let's dictate the prices, let's control the whole shit. And that's completely not what is going to fly. The problem at the moment is the lack is simply, you know, the lack of, yeah, we don't, it doesn't have a purpose at the moment, right? It doesn't have a purpose in a way that, that it was fascinating to see what was called Second Life, you know, back then when it came out, you know, oh, there was like a virtual me that's kind of interesting. What can it do? Yeah, not much. Okay, I'm out of here. And the same thing seems to be happening at the moment, you know, when there is a real problem being solved through that. And the price point is like 500 euros to buy a bloody, you know, headset, then it's going to be great. You know, then from there we can then evolve. evolve. But currently it seems that, you know, you know, gaming is okay, not so great. So I think everything is open. I wish for, I see the point. I see the point if we can meet people, for example, you know, we would fly to a workshop to China, you know, for a week, you know, but we could also do that in three days, probably virtual. Is it going to be much fun? Maybe not, but maybe there's other needs, you know, uh, you know, then just having fun with it. But this would be, you know, something where I can see, okay, that makes sense somehow. And if this is solved, you know, in a, in a way that we easily can adopt it, it's great. But as long as there's nothing there, you know, that I find, because I find like, I'm, I'm the idiot who buys that shit, you know, if I see something. Yeah. Um, Right. And if there is nobody tells me, you know, this is the thing that you need to get now. I have maybe I have the wrong friends, you know, but nobody told me to buy the, the, the meta, you know, goggles yet. You know, I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah. So much for the yeah. metaverse. <laughs> it's one of those subjects that I feel like sometimes I hate bringing up, but it's also one of those ones that continuously kind of evolves in conversation. And I think that the fact that like, it's still this hypothetical in this world that we don't ex like understand yet. Like, I think that's why there's so much desire in it as well. And then, and, and talking about it, but talking about more tangible items, there was a question in here of, I love these cards. Is there a place I can get them? What's happening with these cards that you kind of shared with us today? Can people get access that's to good. them? That's a good question. Yeah, we, we Thomas and me debated about that as well. What we can, I think, do, I mean, you guys are going to kill us with the postage, but the first five people leaving us a message on Instagram, I think I can fairly say can get like a set of that. We only produced like a bunch of them, a bunch of the boxes. We produced card sets. We produced boxes somewhere else. And we gave them to a bunch of, of course, to a bunch of clients. And we gave them to a bunch of our collaborators and fellow design friends. And we might print some more at some point, you know, but yeah. So guys, drop us, drop us a message, the first five ones on the Instagram account. We're going to send it to you and hope that it's not going to be so costly for us to get the stuff shipped to you. <laughs> Awesome. We really appreciate that. I'd love to really thank both of you for coming and sharing with us today. As a reminder, our vision here at the Patent Institute is a world that seeks designers for the way that they think rather than what they produce. And thank you again so much to Andreas and Thomas. It was a real pleasure today. So.